Richard for that uh, presentation. I'd like now to invite Nasir Ahmed uh, from UKIFC. So we're going to have two um, UKIFC presentations. And first from Nasir Ahmed. He's presently serving as a partner at Ernst & Young. Uh, he will talk about post-crisis regulation and Islamic finance. His detailed bio is in, in the program. Um, and I'd like him to speak for, if possible, 20 minutes uh, so we can fit things in with him and uh, Umar uh, Suleiman, inshallah. Thank you. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm currently a partner at Ernst & Young um, looking at large uh, UK banks and I work in risk and uh, regulation. So sort of uh, come from uh, that area and have done recently quite a bit of work in Basel III. Um, so this presentation has um, sort of um, a wishful uh, sort of thinking nature to it and some um, speculative is the wrong word to use in this context, but speculative in the sense of uh, thinking speculation. Um, and the, the main idea is that the, there was this 2007 crisis, and that costs a lot. Uh, I have some numbers, uh, 10 trillion. I do not want to keep the suspense for too long. Uh, but well, for example, in the US. Um, but then there was a lot of and loss of trust and so on. And then there are people who are regulators or government officials or lawyers or consultants or academics. And then they say, OK, we would like to avoid that in the future. Uh, we would not want this to happen. It's too costly. And why would people get away with wrongdoing and so on? So then they say, I would like to describe a perfect financial system so that these bad things do not happen. And there is nowhere, maybe Canada is an exception, uh, but um, th they can go where they see a very good financial system. Um, so it's in a way a possibility of the mind. So they describe, they say, this is how it should be, and this is how it should be, and this is how a bank's balance sheet should look like, this is how much derivatives it should do, this is how the, the, the salary structure should be, and the bonus structure should be, and so on. Um, this is how much debt the bank should have, and this it should never exceed that value, and so on. So they describe various characteristics of this sort of invisible animal, because no one can see it. Um, and then there are many papers on it, many books have been written, and a lot of regulation has come out, as everyone knows, Basel III is one example, uh, but there are many other uh, regulations. So there is this. So when I read that for work and so on, so yeah, I mean, it's interesting, and it makes sense, and how things could become more stable via those new uh, descriptions, uh, regulation you can call it, sometimes it's just wishful thinking, and so on. Uh, so I read that, and then totally separately, I read about Islamic finance. Uh, so nothing to do with the two, uh, the two activities with each other, just the fact the only common thing is that I am reading both. Uh, so, and I read, and then it looks that, not everything, but a lot of what is described, at least in theory, and that's a very important point, um, at least in theory in Islamic banking is closely related to, not in all aspects, but in several aspects, to what that theoretical ideal is being described. So in that way, that's a remarkable thing, because in some ways Islamic finance has been growing uh, in the past for some time, and now it is roughly around 2% of the world, sort of Islamic banks are roughly 2% of the world banking market. So in that way, it is growing, but it's still very small. So, um, so people do not generally know. I mean, the people in this room are obviously an exception uh, because they are interested in Islamic finance. But otherwise, it's not very well known. So in that way, it's quite a remarkable fact that that thing which is being described as the ideal bank or ideal banking system is to make a guess between 60 to 80% of what Islamic banking has described or should describe, because not all aspects are, are, are articulated in utmost detail. Uh, so then this is a very striking sort of observation, in some ways by chance. Um, and then there is this thought that 
Islamic banking in future, because it is not true for the moment, uh, can play this role, and that role would be that regulators, and we are not just targeting regulators or government uh, officials in treasury and so on, would think that Islamic bank is an ideal bank, and it would actually contribute to the stability of a country's economy. So one thing is obviously the intermediation function and banking and so on, but a totally different thing would be they would say, yes, your bank should be like an Islamic bank because Islamic bank contributes to the stability of the economy and in that way we are pro this thing. So if that were to happen, that would be a very good thing and that would be a catalyst which would go much beyond the the, the normal growth rate, so if you were to project, and I, we know, all know the, the, the dangers of that projection, a straight line projection and so on, but it's 2% now and some time back it was 1% and so on and uh, it can't be 102% in uh, a few decades. So, but yes, but then it would grow organically in that way, but here it would grow in a very different way because if, if that were to happen, then governments would realize that Islamic banks, if they are true to the spirit of the Islamic finance, then they would contribute to the stability of an economic system in which they operate. And sort of taking one step further, maybe to the last step, the reasoning is that if there are Islamic banks which are very big, there are currently none, um, uh, like uh, 500 billion asset size and so on, so, and if they are very big Islamic banks, then those would be international banks, and then they would also contribute to the stability of the global financial system. So this is sort of the main idea, uh, and uh, it is very striking that the post-crisis banking regulation, so not Islamic banking regulation, but just banking regulation, how close it is in spirit to certain aspects, I'm not saying all aspects, of Islamic finance principles. So the objective is to explore that a bit in the remaining 15 minutes. Uh, so just very quickly recap on the goal of this presentation. So crises are very expensive and should be minimized. Some people think that because of human nature they cannot be totally eliminated. Uh, I'm not a psychologist, but yes, it makes sense. Um, and they have multiple causes. So the causes are, and this is, this is, this is very surprising stuff. So the causes are well known. So people know, it's very well documented also. Lots of articles, books, famous people, Nobel laureates and so on. Um, and they are simple to understand. So these are the causes of the crisis. I'm not talking about just the 2007 crisis, banking crisis in general. There are certain books that talk about eight centuries of folly and so on, uh, which is given in the reference. But research has shown that and there are uh, references, as I mentioned at the end, that the main culprit is excessive debt accumulation. So debt, whether it's debt of a given bank or inside the bank of a given portfolio, uh, whether it's funded by CDS or whatever, or it's government debt or it's private debt. So that is a very big sort of main culprit, is excessive debt accumulation, and it's often fueled by greed in the case of banking crisis. I mean, yes, everyone knows that, and I mean, yeah, in that way. Um, so this, but this is a very big sort of result if you were to summarize those, what has been written on the crisis. And then the recommended actions, so we focus on the banking crisis now because the different type of crisis, the currency crisis, and then the sovereign default crisis and so on. So there are four types, I briefly sketch uh, those out. But we are focusing in this presentation on the banking crisis. So the recommended actions are, if there is too much debt, is to reduce debt. So lower the leverage in it and higher capital requirements, and this is one of the main points of Basel III. Um, and if there is too much greed, then the another point is to reduce the greed. So keep greed in check so there is better incentives, so on the bonus and pay, and on the long-term impacts. So he, someone can, the bank can take back your bonus uh, after several years if it is realized that your contribution was not very good um, or was overly short term. And then the Bank of, the bank of England's governor, so Mark Carney has spoken uh, this year several times about code of ethics. There was a famous speech in, 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 in May and now uh, in November 
where it says that it is not possible that the bankers don't have a proper code of ethics and they operate like this. And many banks do have a code of ethics, but it's not clear to what extent the traders do uh, subscribe to that. So these are sort of code of ethics and social responsibility. And then obviously there are more, uh, more, more recommendations on liquidity, governance, transparency, and so on. Um, so many of these recommendations would in some ways be very close to what an Islamic finance textbook or Islamic banking textbook would describe. And that is quite a big thing. So in some ways, in that way, if you were pursuing that thought, in that way, an Islamic bank would be an ideal bank. Yep. Um, so just to finish off this thing, so yeah, these measures have been described, and some people think that these measures are too little too late and it would not help and there would be another crisis and so on and it's in the, 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 in, in the process of, uh, of formation and so uh, um, But nonetheless, reducing debt accumulation and keeping greed in check and not just at a high level but with, uh, with uh, laws as like in, like in Basel III and other regulation, then this should be the natural part of the DNA of an Islamic bank or an ethical bank. So in that way, one very big problem for many conventional banks these days is they say there is this avalanche or even tsunami of regulation and so on, and that affects our business model and so on, and then it's very difficult to make profits. And, or, uh, I mean, obviously I'm simplifying. Uh, um, but then if the business model of an Islamic bank is irrespective of the regulation of a certain type, and that type naturally takes into account the new regulation, then that is built in. So in that way, it would be very much pro the new regulation. And if that can be, then there is only one small step is to show that it's profitable. Now <laughs> It's a big step. So in that, if that can be done, then it would be a very good attractive model. So if someone can show that, yes, what the regulators or the professors and so on or governments have said, an Islamic bank, ABC bank, is like that, and ABC bank is profitable, and this is demonstrable, then that could be then taken as an ideal model of, of, Islamic, uh, of, of banking. Not of Islamic banking, of banking. So hence, the main idea, the main goal, is to say that Islamic banks can potentially be seen in the future as a good model of banking, uh, I mean, it's a far shot. I, I understand it's a long shot. But, so it, but the certain conditions have to be met is that they should represent a significant portion of the economy. So 2% is very small. Uh, have lower debt levels, which is the case for the Islamic banks that exist. That is the case mostly. Can demonstrate good code of conduct, governance, and risk culture. I mean, these terms you would talk, uh, you hear about a lot. Obviously, code of conduct, governance, risk culture is very, very much uh, fashion of the day. But I mean, it has some substance in it also, and yet show sustained profitability, because then there would be this thing if you say no, but the monitoring costs are very high, or all this thing I am not able to. Or the, so, and last but not least, are able to educate their customers and investors. So, I mean, that's a very important point because if the investor or the customer says, no, but I will put a deposit and I want the same return as the other bank. So I am, the return should be the same, but the risk should be, uh, yeah, it cannot be more, actually. So if the depositor is not really an in investment account holder, then it's a bit different. So then you have to say, yeah, I take it to the logical conclusion. So I mean, if there are many ifs, so no clear evidence that Islamic banks have been able to do the above. There is no clear evidence. I mean, I have not seen it. Uh, and if you have, I mean, would appreciate if you can mention that to me. Um, but it can still happen in the near future, even though it's not straightforward. It would be quite complicated even. Yeah? So this is the idea. Uh, so type of crisis. They say, I mean, there are hundreds of ways of classifying crisis, but a famous book, which is reference one uh, at the end, um, is Kenneth Rogoff. I think uh, some people may have heard about it. The book came out, um, I think, two years ago or three years ago, and the title is uh, very provocative. It says, this time is different. 
but obviously it's said in an ironic way and it's all described in the book that it's not different. This time is exactly the same as many previous times. And then the subtitle says eight centuries of financial folly. So it says that many crises are the same, but each time people think it's new. So then I was just sort of trying to read and understand it, and it was sort of thought that it may be a dry book, but it turned out to be quite interesting. And then looked at uh, John Galbraith, and it said finance is a, is a discipline where history has no role because people have such short memories that as soon as it happens, it's forgotten. So then the same thing happens, and so people, that's, this, I have a quote from it, uh, maybe you like it later. So anyway, so these are the type of crises, so banking, sovereign default, exchange rate, very high inflation. And the objective of this talk is focusing on banking crisis. Uh, so banking crisis, research findings, I try to summarize a lot of research for you in a few bullet points. So main reason, highly leveraged portfolios, especially with short-term borrowing. And that was the case in 2007. Um, so what happens in a banking crisis is heavy investment losses lead to significant part of the banking sector becoming insolvent. Yes, we know all. Depositors lose confidence, and then Northern Rock, and then you have queues and so on. But actually, that the regulator did resolve in a good way. Um, so, I mean, at least uh, seen from far. Um, and then a very big thing is that on average, government debt rises by around 85% during the three years following a banking crisis. So now whether it's 83.5 or 70, that's not important, but it's a very high number. And then the government debt rises by that amount to a, due to a banking crisis. So banking crises need to be stopped. And if Islamic banking can contribute in stopping that, then obviously it could be seen as a good thing. Uh, so... Um, Yeah, there are some strange sort of findings of the, those research. For example, it says, periods of high international capital mobility have repeatedly produced international banking crisis. Potential reasons is too much innovation, uh, inadequate regulation, and lack of supervision. So maybe, it's, but I think that, yes, a lot of evidence is given, so it's true in that way. And another strange thing is that sovereign default crisis does not affect rich and poor countries equally. So poor countries are more affected and everyone knows. And so, uh, but rich countries used to be affected at that time. They were not that rich, uh, like now again coming. Uh, so th then at that time, but in some ways, economic theory shows that that has been solved. Uh, but that is not true for banking crisis. So it affects both rich and poor countries. Uh, one exception to the banking crisis always given in different books, um, and I have lived in Canada, so it's good to see that, uh, is Canada. But I mean, yeah, that would take us too far to discuss what was the reason and so on. But Mark Carney is from Canada. Uh, yeah. Uh, so um, so it's a, maybe a good choice then. So crises have a very high cost. So what is the cost of the crisis? They can undermine the whole financial system. So a quotation, which would have been almost impossible to, uh, to visualize, um, 10 years ago, and this is from Mark Carney, Bank of England governor, capitalism is at, the, at risk of destroying itself unless bankers realize they have an obligation to create a fairer society. And obviously the word fair needs to be defined and so on, and we know, and, but that's a very important sort of thing, and it was said on 28th May this year. And then there was a lot of discussion on rising inequality, and as everyone has heard it maybe, uh, of that famous French economist, uh, Thomas Piketty, uh, and the book, which is many people use it, a doorstopper, which is not necessarily the best to use, but is that book, which got many awards and so on, and is the McKinsey FT Award and uh, just last week, and that book is Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, and the main thesis of the book is that there is rising inequality. So in that way, very few people control a lot of wealth, which in some ways is failure of economics. Um, and then there is loss of trust in the financial system. So these are the costs which are important things because that would then undermine. Uh, but then the Dallas Fed estimated in 2013 that the cost only restricted to the U.S. of the 2007 financial crisis was around $10 trillion. And that's a conservative estimate. So that's really a lot of money. And obviously, then opportunity cost and un unemployment and so on. So it is a very big thing, a very big deal. So avoiding crisis is something very important. So one cannot say, oh, but we have to live with it. It's part of the system and so on. It is not. 
as one thing which I will very shortly mention. Uh, so, okay, what are the important lessons from financial crisis? One is extremely short memory in finance. Most crises are very much in common with previous ones. Um, so if you do not learn from past mistakes, then you're bound to repeat them. I think Emerson said that. Uh, then most important reason for all types of crises is debt accumulation, whether by government, banks, corporations, or consumers, or indirect government guaranteed debt, uh, debt for example, deposit insurance. And risk from debt is underestimated in good and normal times. So debt distorts reality and like infusions of cash when government spends money, it provides less growth than it appears to provide. Housing and stock prices are, get inflated beyond long run sustainable values due to private sector debt. And we've seen that, so there is 100% uh, clear evidence for it. And it makes banks look more profitable than they actually are. So people get used to that bad thing and return of equity of 16%, which is not sustainable. So, Conclusion makes an economy vulnerable to crisis of confidence. Obviously, there are other things which cannot be covered in such a short talk, what herd mentality, mass psychology, and so on. Um, now, the next slide is about financial innovation, which I have put in quotes, and all the quotes are from Galbraith, so famous Harvard economist, ambassador, uh, US ambassador to India for two years, and so on, and has written a lot about crisis. Uh, so it says, all financial innovation involves in one form or another the creation of debt secured in greater or lesser adequacy by real assets. So it's creation of debt, all in uh, financial innovation, CDO squared or a simple bond, maybe have many things in common in that way. Um, uh, and greater or lesser adequacy of real assets. And there is a slide that talks about that linked to Islamic then because real economy and so on. And sometimes it's to a lesser degree and then lesser and lesser, yeah? So what, I have five more minutes? Two minutes, all right. Uh, so basically, and then I, would, then I would conclude on that, is that which are the key principles in Islamic finance that would, if done to the, to the if taken to their logical conclusion, would, would uh, then benefit uh, society and stability of a banking system, is that equity financing rather than debt financing, which implies that there is less debt. Uh, risk is shared with investors, even depositors. Bank has skin in the game. So there was an article, um, it came in the New York Times on 23rd October, so less than a month ago, that, and the title of that article says, banks again avoid having any skin in the game which was trying to show that it is getting riskier. So bank has skin in the game, which is their own stake. So in a musharaka or, uh, yeah. Um, so more focus on real economy, not artificial, purely financial transactions. And w one very big cause given of crisis is speculation. So speculation is not allowed in Islamic uh, finance. And there is a social responsibility element. And then maybe end with the strong code of ethics. So if a bank is truly Islamic, then the, again, a quote from Mark Carney. Um, it says, bankers had operated a, a, as heads I win, tails you lose system, which is not really possible in a truly sort of Islamic uh, sense. Yeah. So uh, this was it. So I think that if there is an Islamic bank which takes Islamic principles to its logical conclusion and it's a big end, is also profitable, sustainable profitability, then it will be seen as a model by many people, whether they are regulators or governments or other banks, as a model bank. Anyway, thank you very much.